Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the GABA-A receptor and the benzodiazepine drugs. Right, okay, so, uh, we were just talking about the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane and how it's, how much the value that a machine uh, measuring electrical potential would change if it moved from extracellular to intracellular. Okay, so, usually, this is around negative 65 millivolts across the cell membrane. So what does that actually mean? That means that the electrical potential of the intracellular compartment is lower than the electrical potential of the extracellular compartment, and it's lower by 65 millivolts. Okay, now, chloride anions are negatively charged. They want to be where the electrical potential is higher. So they want to be in the extracellular compartment, basically. Now, um, basically, we're saying that if we open this GABA-A receptor, the chloride anions are going to come into the cell. That doesn't seem to make sense because they're going to want to be in the extracellular compartment. But basically, the, grade, the concentration gradient between chloride anions in the extracellular fluid and the chloride anions in the intracellular fluid beats the electrical gradient that is trying to keep them in the extracellular fluid. So basically, uh, the concentration of chloride anions in the extracellular fluid is far higher than the concentration of chloride anions in the intracellular fluid. Okay? And this is going to favour the movement of chloride anions into the cell, whilst the electrical potential gradient is going to favour the uh, remaining of the chloride anions in the extracellular fluid. However, the concentration gradient is greater than this electrical gradient, so you still get a net movement of chloride anions uh, into the cell when you open these GABA-A receptors, even when you factor in this information about the electrical potential difference. Now, what does that movement of chloride anions in achieve? Well, basically, um, chloride has this negative charge. So you are moving negative charge from the extracellular fluid into the intracellular fluid. Now, when you put negative charge into the intracellular fluid, that is going to reduce the electrical potential in the intracellular fluid. Okay, so this number here is going to go down, so this is going down. When you remove negative charge from the extracellular fluid, which you have to if you're moving it from here to here, you're moving it from here and you're putting it in here, so you're taking negative charge out of the extracellular fluid, that's going to raise the electrical potential extracellularly. So this number is going up, this one is going down. Now, we started off with the electrical potential intracellularly being 65 millivolts lower, or thereabouts, than the electrical potential extracellularly. But now this number is going down, and this one's going up, so the gap between them, i.e. how much this one is lower than this one, is just going to get even bigger, basically. They're going to become even more polarized, okay? So this number is going to become more negative when you bring in these uh, chloride anions through the GABA-A receptor. And when you take the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane uh, to more negative extremes, this process is known as hyperpolarization. And we say that the membrane has become hyperpolarized when its electrical potential difference across it has become more negative. Right. Okay. So that's the effect of... Um, activating these GABA-A receptors with gamma-aminobutyric acid. Okay, so you're going to hyperpolarize the cells. Now, in order to generate an action potential in this po uh, postsynaptic neuron, you need to depolarize the electrical potential difference. Okay, so this is doing the exact opposite of what you need to uh, generate an action potential. In addition, if you've got, say, another synapse here, Okay, and this other synapse is a stimulatory synapse, so let's say it's releasing glutamate into the synaptic cleft. Glutamate will be acting on glutamate receptors, such as AMPA or kinate receptors, and allowing a uh, positive current to move into the cell. So it will be an eye, maybe sodium ions, to move into the cell, which will have the effect of depolarizing the cell membrane. What might happen is that maybe this new action potential here 
from the stimulatory input would have caused an action potential. However, if we're also activating this inhibitory one, this is making the inside more negative. This stimulatory one's making it more positive. They might just cancel each other out. So, this is basically going to cancel uh, the excitatory inputs that you're getting from other neurons. Okay, so the GABA system is inhibiting uh, act neurons from firing action potentials, basically, by uh, hyperpolarizing uh, the uh, electrical potential difference across the membrane, bringing in this negative current. And by the way, this is what's known as an inhibitory postsynaptic current. When you bring in this negative charge through the GABA-A receptor into the cytoplasm, you are moving charge across the membrane. When charge is moving, that's known as a current. So that's why we call this a current. And also, it's an inhibitory current because it's a negative charge that you're bringing in. So this is what's known as an inhibitory, inhibitory postsynaptic because it's occurring in the postsynaptic cell, this one here, postsynaptic current. And inhibitory postsynaptic current is a bit of a mouthful, so this actually has an acronym, so it's often uh, abbreviated to IPSP, I for inhibitory, PS for postsynaptic, and then, oh whoops, I've given you the wrong acronym. That's an excite inhibitory postsynaptic potential. IPSC, C for current, I, I do apologize for that. What it will cause, this hyperpolarization that it causes, that is then called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. And that will be abbreviated to IPSP. Sorry about that. So when you become more negative, it's called an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So the inhibitory postsynaptic current, the IPSC, causes an IPSP, basically, an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. So, all over the brain, you have these inhibitory synapses where neurons are releasing GABA onto other neurons and stopping them from firing. Now, what would happen if we suddenly stopped all of these GABAergic synapses? So, let's say we just vanished all the GABAergic synapses away then what would happen? Well, now you take away all the inhibition on all of these different neurons um, that is stopping them from firing action potentials in response to stimulation from other excitatory synapses. So what you would get is loads of act neurons firing action potentials that would not have previously fired action potentials. Because let's say, for example, we take this scenario here. Here's our simulatory synapse, here's our inhibitory synapse. If they both are firing together, then it's going to have no effect on the neuron. If we suddenly took away the GABAergic transmission here, um, then the excitatory input now might just be able to trigger an action potential. So you'd get massive firing of neurons where they weren't firing before. So it's very, very dangerous if you take away GABAergic neurotransmission. And I'll just write that word down. So when we're talking about the GABA uh, as a neurotransmitter and acting on other cells, we often use the um, odd terminology of GABAergic transmission. Okay, so if you were to take away all GABAergic transmission, you'd get basically loads of neurons in the brain firing continuously. So you get overactivity, overfiring of neurons in the brain. Now, basically, it's not as extreme as this. It's, I've just, just described to you taking away all GABAergic neurotransmission. But basically, there are certain diseases which are associated with reduced GABAergic transmission. So, for instance, many forms of epilepsy occur because GABAergic transmission is too low. Now, what would happen if GABAergic transmission was too low? Well, exactly what I've just described to you. Loads of these stimulatory neurons that were stimulating the cell continuously, but were having their stimulatory effect uh, counterposed by the inhibitory effect of the GABAergic synapse. If this is reduced, then the stimulatory one will now achieve the activation of the neuron, which it shouldn't have. And therefore, you're going to get overfiring within the brain, and that can lead to uh, epileptic seizures, basically. Okay?
In addition, slight reductions in the GABAergic transmission are also believed to potentially underlie anxiety. And I should say that um, there are not particularly rich theories of the cause of things like anxiety, which is a uh, neurosis. We don't have a great understanding of um, anxiety. Uh, however, um, oh, sorry, that should have a neurosis like that. Okay. Um, however, what you what we notice is that if you upregulate GABAergic transmission, and indeed we're going to see drugs that do upregulate GABAergic transmission, then what that will cause it will, is it will reduce the amount of firing of neurons within the brain, and this basically has an anxiolytic effect or anti-anxiety effect. So anxiolytic basically means stopping anxiety. So anxio for anxiety. Lytic means to um, break apart, basically. Lysis is when things break apart. Um, so it's stopping anxiety, basically. Okay, um, so we think anxiety is basically resulting from a little bit too much overactivity within the brain, too many neurons firing, and then when you upregulate GABAergic transmission and reduce the um, amount of activity within the brain, uh, the amount of neurons firing, uh, then that seems to have an anxiolytic effect, and we'll see that many drugs which do act on the GABAergic system uh, are used uh, as anxiolytics. Okay, and also they'll be used in the treatment of epilepsy. That's easier to understand why uh, the reduction in GABAergic transmission is going to cause that, because epilepsy is all about over-activity of the neurons. Right, okay, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll do is we'll move on to the actual structure of these GABA-A receptors.